Okay, well, welcome along to our first um, Australia-New Zealand combined GG online hangout event. Um, we're really, really excited to have um, some fantastic people joining us from all across Australia and across in New Zealand, although we did have Amy from New Zealand in the call before and um, she was getting attacked by her pet cat and I noticed that she's fallen off, so maybe she'll join back on in a little while. Uh, so we're basically going to go to run through a bit of an edgy win uh, from each of the people here this evening uh, and then we're going to see a bit of a live classroom demonstration and there's going to be a chance for uh, questions in relation to that. The Q&A app should be um, up and running and uh, uh, if you would like to chuck in any questions in there we will endeavour um, to address them as the evening unfolds. Um, All right. Is everybody at this and ready to start? Thumbs up, everyone who's in our hangout. All good. Is Kimberly frozen on us? I think so, Wes. So if you want to go ahead, that'd be awesome. Okay, then. Uh, my name is Wes Warner. I'm the uh, head of ICT uh, at Genesis Christian College on the north side of uh, Brisbane. Uh, today, what I'm going to show you just very quickly is looking at uh, Google Maps and now with Street View with the historical imagery. So I'm just going to share my screen now at the moment. And here we've got... Um, you know, the normal stock standard uh, or bog standard you know, Google Maps here and if I grab Pegman, now I can drag Pegman down, drop him on as per normal and we go into a bit of street view and we can have a look at this particular area of where I sort of, you know, near where I live. Wes, can you, sorry Wes, can you just share your screen with us again? Oh, have I not screen shared it? Oh. Thanks. I went through all the good stuff. And oh, is that good? Yep, fantastic. Okay, so look, I'll just go back, you know, you've got your stock standard uh, Google Maps there, and I'll just drag Pigman in. Drop him in there, and we can see this particular part of Brendale, where near where I live. Now we've got this new part here, which is the historical maps, and we can go back into historical street view. So if I click on the new, I can now have a little slider here to show you the particular uh, part of the maps. You can see this is the current uh, view that we've got here at the moment, and this was in 2009. And then if we go back into 2008, you can see that you know the re real estate there was quite different. If we just travel a little bit further up. You can see that the the maps will all or the the pictures will also show according accordingly uh, to where you actually move drive along to. So you can see how much land has actually changed over the time. Now this is uh, quite interesting to note this particular area where I live is because this entire hill just drive up a little bit further. Go up to the top of the hill. And we'll look around here. You can see that uh, whole hill looks quite flat there, but prior to that, there was this hill that where there was quite a large uh, koala population that used to live in through here. Uh, and it's really good for students having a look at uh, how uh, mankind has actually changed the environment even over a short period of time. You know, in my area, there's only been three sets of uh, street view photographs, but um, in more urban areas, you will actually find that there's you know, quite a lot of uh, you know, street view uh, photography that's been taken place, especially in the uh, in the urban areas like Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne. So that's uh, what I wanted to show you with the historical imagery there now in Street View on Google Maps.
Excellent. Thanks, Wes. Can you um, uh, have you seen it used by uh, any of the teachers at your school at all? Uh, have I seen it? No, not as yet. Um, they keep me uh, locked in my own classroom without getting outside. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, hopefully, maybe maybe that can be your term three resolution is to um, visit someone else's class and. Um, and see them actually making use of that fantastic tool because that um, I can see lots of really practical applications, not even just in you know our, our geography classes. Um, and I can imagine kids would have a, a great time um, checking out how their area in Melbourne or wherever they live has changed over time. Um, all right, I'm going to share a quick um, edu win now, and so I should have sorry started. That was remiss of me at the start to not introduce myself. My name is Kimberly Hall, and I am part of uh, GG Melbourne. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk very, very briefly uh, about uh, some of the ways that students and staff um, are using Google Plus uh, in schools that I work with. So. Let's just see if my screen sharing Okay, can everybody see my screen? Not yet, no. Uh, no, not yet. Nope. No. Can't see my screen as well? Okay, looks like Kimberly might be having a few connection issues. So if it's okay, Penny, are you happy for us to jump to you? Sure. Awesome. No worries. Okay, are people hearing me okay? Yep. Yep, great. Um, okay, so I'm going to just share my screen here. Uh, can people see my... S hang on. Can people see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. So um, one of the things about YouTube, it's got fantastic content on it. I use clips all the time. Uh, sometimes you just want to direct a student to a small clip in the middle of a YouTube. And um, it's fairly easy. I'll just show you. Um, most people know how to start in the middle of a clip. If you just right click, you can get, uh, get video URL at the current time. But that doesn't... Uh -oh. But that doesn't stop the clip. Um, so one of the ways that you can stop a clip is I might just find a clip that I actually want to use. Might do that in YouTube. Uh, uh, sorry, in Google. Uh, if I just look at Mission Impossible Four, uh, I look at videos and search tools. Uh, it gives you the op opportunity to choose your duration. So I'm going to look for the whole movie because I'm cheeky. But I just want a specific bit out of it to show the students to engage them and ask them questions. Uh, I can actually force it to be from YouTube as well and other results drop out. So let's just go to this movie. Might just uh... And what I want to do is I'm going to add this to... Well, I'm going to add this to a playlist. Uh, so you go down, you go add to. And the playlist I'm going to add to is this one. Now I've already scoped where the clip is uh, that I want in this particular video. So if I just go and find the playlist, click on my name, there's the playlist. If I click that, it will play it. If I click this one, so we've got our uh, nano gloves a possibility. I just might move the order here up. If you click this over here, this more, you can actually edit start and end times. So I'm going to click on that. And if anyone's played around with the YouTube editor, you would know that you can slide these and um, it's fairly easy to crop. A video. So I'm going to slide to the particular part that I want, which is around about 56 seconds. And there we go. Then I'm going to crop it. The minimum crop time is 15 seconds. 
Uh, so I'm going to go, that will do. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And then you'll see, if I just move my cursor, that that says 15 seconds there. So then I'm going to play my playlist. This particular clip was about engaging students um, as to whether or not they could use nano gloves. And so you can just send them to a particular part of a video without having to send them only to the end time. And you can add other clips in as well. So I've just added this clip in just for a bit of fun. I actually got this out of the YouTube editor and made my own caption. And that's my slam. So. Right, so if I just go back to my screen and stop screen sharing. Uh oh, there we go, I'll just do it. Yep, so I'm done. Uh oh, now my YouTube's playing. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me close that window, shall we? All right. So that's that's the whole thing. Uh oh. Not Thanks, fine. Penny. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, everybody. I think we were going to try and go back to Kimberly. Um, but I, I think her internet is playing up a little bit there. So we're going to um, we're going to play a little game, if that's okay. Um, and we are going to um, play a guessing game. And the guessing game that we're going to play is that we have one member of our Hangout team who is sitting in a public space, um, and we would like anyone to guess where he is. We'll give you ten seconds to do that, and if you've got a, a thought, then you can put it in the uh, in the Q and A. Chris Betcher, are you ready to um, share your mobile wisdom? Uh, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, awesome. Off you go, mate. Spoiler alert, like you said, he, like they could have guessed. So I, um, I am wandering around a place of a man because my uh, internet connection at home, my bandwidth, because it's nearly the end of the month, um, it's nearly all used for the month. And because my wife works at home, uh, I kind of had to leave her some bandwidth to get through the next four days. So I'm actually out and about at the moment, wandering around. Uh, in the public Are place. you in a sports bar? I'm not in a sports bar. Hang on, let me just adjust these earphones. So I'm in a public place, and um, I'm actually on my Nexus 5 phone, and I'm broadcasting uh, live from uh, here. Let me turn the camera around, and I'm sure you'll be able to guess exactly where I am. I can find the camera button. Uh, right there. Okay, so you should now have my my rear facing camera. Mackers. And you've probably figured it out I'm getting Mackers. So I think it's time for Sunday, don't you? So let me go up to the counter and order a Sunday. You guys feel free to carry on. I can come back to you and you can watch me eating the Sunday later if that's what you'd really like to do. But yeah, so just a little demonstration about how you can use your uh, Hangouts to actually go on. I guess virtual field trips where you could have someone in a remote location and showing students back in your classroom uh, where something is or how something is. I'm just on a 4G connection at the moment. In fact, I'm, I'm probably not even on 4G. I think it's dropped back to 3G. So you see it works actually pretty well. Um, so yeah, great for field trips, virtual field trips, just using Hangouts on a mobile device. Back to you in the studio there, Chris Hart. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Chris Better. And if you can get enough Sundays to go around and pass them out, that'd be awesome. I'll mute Chris there now. Okay, um, we are going to move on, if that's okay. We have um, another one of our Google Certified teachers who was based in Sydney, but is now down here in Melbourne with us, um, Shireen, who is going to talk to us about using um, Google Trends. So, Shireen, are you ready to go? Yep. Awesome. Off you go when you're ready. Okay, um, so 
I actually stumbled onto Google Trends uh, when, sorry, give me a second, sort out my screen here. Um, I stumbled onto Google Trends when I was um, looking at an advertising unit in, um, uh, in class and the kids were all sort of wondering, um, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen share? Not yet, no. Okay, sorry, give me a second. Yep, so, um, so, yeah, screen share, here we go. Okay, so um, I actually stumbled onto Google Trends because the kids were making observations in my class about how uh, the ads in their browsers were related to their searches, and they were sort of like, oh, why are the ads in my browser all related to my searches? And how does Google do all this? So this has been on my mind as well, and I was sort of wondering how it all comes together. And I sort of did a bit of digging around, and I realized that actually you can do it via Google Trends. Now, Google Trends actually allows you to um, have a look at comparing different searches. And so if I was having to search, say, for example, um, gifts at Christmas, then uh, gifts or perfume, really, and in the click of a button, it comes up as, it peaks at certain times, and it's very clear that around Christmas time is when uh, the gift searching really happens. And so that really uh, made me go, oh my god, that's perfect for an advertising study. So previously when I would do advertising, I would look at giving the kids a brand and thinking, oh, let's design an advertisement. Look, it's going to be really cool. We'll look at some advertising videos, look at how to do a thing. But now with Google Trends, I decided I don't even need to show them a brand. It can turn from a completely passive to a great activity, uh, which is completely directed by the students. So we decided we'll do a project help a struggling brand to advertise themselves, and you have to choose from the following brand categories, food, fashion, and mobile phones. So um, the kids decided, yep, that's great, let's do that, and um, they um, had a look at, let me just share this. So I'm trying to go between different screens here and <laughs> Yep, uh, my screen share is acting up, sorry. Can you see my Google Trend search? Yes, we can, we can now. Okay, great, okay. So we had a look at, um, so I then said to the kids, okay, if you're going to choose food and pretty much uh, we came up with junk food brands, uh, we did a search between Macca's, KFC, Red Rooster, and it, Google Trends will actually show you the interest over time, what is the regional interest, so if I click on Macca's, it's most popular in New South Wales, KFC is doing better in Victoria and New South Wales, Hungry Jack's is nowhere on the territory in New South Wales. It's very, uh, very unpopular compared to how it is in South Australia. And what this actually did for the class was monumental because suddenly, rather than me sitting there and saying, oh, this might be popular and that and us playing guessing games, this was real time, this was live, this was current. They could search uh, according to year. They could search um, from um, 2013 alone and um, Interestingly, KFC still dominates, um, as it still does in my household. And um, so uh, the kids could really start to make a, a real insightful uh, judgment about how the brand actually works. And then they actually said, well, 
rather than us sort of doing an advertisement for the struggling brand, can we even decide which region we want to do it in? Which was brilliant because then they could decide that, oh, say for example, they wanted to uh, help Maccas out, uh, and uh, you know, how would you brand Maccas in say Victoria or South Australia? And then you could do trends on what really is popular with Victorians and South Australians. So, you know, Victorians are more indoorsy people, doing sort of trends on what works there and really looking at their marketing gimmick. And the possibilities were endless. So, um, suddenly, we went from um, doing uh, a project that was very, very teacher driven to doing a project that was completely student-centered and student-dominated. So uh, this was um, not only uh, passive to active learning, uh, but digital literacy and empowering students. Um, and uh, there's also wonderful articles on how Google Trends works, which I'm happy to share. There's a PowerPoint that I sort of did and tried to work out with the slide share, but it was a fantastic edu-in in the classroom. Ta-da! <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Serene. That's brilliant. Um, Kimberly, how are we going? Are you are you happy to go back to you? Okay, I think we might have we might have lost Kimberly for the moment. Amy, are you happy for us to jump across the um, sea to New Zealand? Yeah, go for it. Fantastic. Okay, well, we'll pass you across to Amy. Can you introduce yourself and tell us where you are? Okay. Um, so, oh, my computer's playing up a little bit. I'll see how I go. I've just changed completely what I'm going to do because I couldn't pull up the things I needed. I'll try and share my screen. Oh, is that not working? I'm just going to talk about a few um, extensions and apps that... Uh, oh, are helping um, us as a staff at the moment. I'm having a few uh, Wi-Fi issues, so bear with me. Is it coming up yet? Yep, we can see your screen share now. Awesome. Okay, so um, the first one that we um, are using quite a lot is uh, Street for Gmail. So this was this is really a um, designed to manage customers and things like that. We use the function where you can track your emails and see who's reading your emails, um, who's receiving them, and that's really good for seeing um, when we're sending emails out to our parent community, who's actually reading them, and what kind of views they're getting. So that just sits in your um, mail browser, in your mail, and you can um, see when things have been sent and, and who's been reading them. So it can be a bit big brother, but it can be really interesting to see who, um, what kind of impact your emails are having. Um, another extension that we use quite a lot is OneFeed, where we get all of our, where you get all your social media bought to you. Um, so a new tab, when it opens, can be customised. So we have all of our um, school blogs coming into this feed, and you can easily see it through here. Um, I'm slowly losing connection here. Um, and the last one is OneCloud, where um, you can easily get a word cloud and um, paste it into a site or anything like that. So it takes a summary of the content on a website and um, makes a word, word tag cloud of it. There you go. Awesome, and thank, thank you so much for Amy. Amy, do you just want to tell people who are watching, as we may have some Kiwis there as well, about Gag New Zealand? Yeah, so um, we started that probably about three weeks ago, and um, I think we've got about 250 members, and we're just looking at running our first kind of um, 
event in the next couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, it's really taking off. So yeah. And we've been using Melbourne as a really good example and kind of following your lead, so it's been fabulous. That was the, that was the compliment we were fishing for there, Amy, thank you. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> no, 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 so it's great news to see that other GEGs or Google Educator Groups are getting off the ground um, yeah, across been, Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. It's been really popular, so um, yeah, it's, it's good. Okay, so... We're going to pass across now to, um, thank you very much, Jimmy. We're going to pass across now to um, Eleni, who is one of our members of, one of our founding members of um, the Google Educator Group in Melbourne. And Eleni is going to um, share an edge you in and also give a shout out to an upcoming event as well. So when you're ready, Eleni, thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. I have to apologize. It is the end of term, so I am losing my voice. The fun and joys of being a teacher and end of term. But I'm here just to share my edu win on Genius Hour. So I'm currently teaching Year 6 at a Catholic primary school in Melbourne, and I've incorporated Genius Hour into our learning. So I'll give you just a brief description on what Genius Hour is. So Genius Hour came from Google's 80-20 time where Google educators, uh, Google employees, sorry, got to spend 20% of their time working on a project of their own. So this is now being implemented in classrooms around the world um, where students are posing questions that are non google So these questions that students are posing are getting them to not actually um, research things that they know, but we're teaching students how to learn, not what to learn, through these non google questions. So there's three steps. They've got to have their question, they've got to do the research, and then they've got to present it in some way. And the students worked on this throughout a term, and at the end of the term, I wanted the students to share their work. So originally, I thought it would be really cool to share it through a Google Hangout, and just to allow parents to see it. But then, I got thinking about it and thought, why not share it with other classes around Australia that we blog with? So I created the Hangout and shared it with others and the response has been fantastic because not only are my students presenting to over 100 people, but they are also getting questions in real time straight back to them. So. Um, I'll share my blog at the end and they love hearing comments so if anyone wants to leave them a comment but it hasn't stopped there just by them presenting through Google Hangouts. I've actually connected with Anthony and his school and next term we have got a group of students who will be working on a Genius Hour project through the use of Google Docs so they have not actually physically met and they won't meet. It's all planned and implemented through Google Docs. So that's quite exciting um, to allow them just to make their learning authentic and to give it a purpose and even by watching others presentations on Genius Hour it really allows students to reflect and think about their own, their own learning and what impact it's having and what others actually think so that's my little edgy win and the other thing I'm here to share um, with you all today is the upcoming GEG Melbourne and this event is called Back to School where simply all educators in Melbourne, we're all coming together and we're going to share all the great tools that we're using in our class through Google and they're going to be set with mini tasks or mini projects that they need to do and collaborating with others and seeing how many ways can you use Google to present a project. So. That's coming up um, next term, week two of next term. So hopefully we get to see a lot of people there because I'm really excited to see what other educators have to share in Melbourne. So hopefully see a few more faces there. So that's my little spiel. That's awesome. Thanks, Lenny. I think is my is my internet unfrozen now? Yeah, you're good now. Oh, good. So. Um, if, if anyone from Telstra happens to be watching this, um, you know, if you could do something about my ADSL connection, that would be awesome. Um, but I just wanted to chime in here because um, I've been lucky enough to be doing some um, work with Eleni and I've got to see uh, her classroom in action and also um, joined in for their two 
uh, hangouts on air last term and this term with her kids sharing their Genius Hour projects and they've been really, really awesome. Um, and then I also went across to Anthony Speranza School who Eleni mentioned um, and got to see his kids um, presenting yesterday um, and uh, you know Lenny's class was watching and the ability for those guys to actually um, have the students in, in different schools and different places actually um, connect and question and challenge each other um, has been really really fantastic to watch and um, uh, yeah I would definitely encourage other people to connect with um, Lenny if they want to know more details about that because it's been some really powerful learning for her kids and the work that they're producing um, is scarily good for um, a grade six uh, level, so that's really fantastic. Um, now, I don't know, Chris, do you think I should um, try and share my screen or are we pushing our luck since I just bagged Telstra and the live hangout? You've probably been banned for life from using Telstra's data now, but I'll give it a go, and if not, we'll okay. just skip on. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen and um, let's see. Um, Oh, is that working? Yeah. All right, awesome. So hopefully you guys can all see um, Google Plus now. Um, and uh, one of the things that I thought would might be worth having a quick uh, look at tonight was um, Google Plus because uh, we are seeing more and more uh, educators starting to use Google Plus as a professional networking space. Um, and I actually got a phone call this evening from um, a brilliant lady called Chris, who I have the pleasure of working with, uh, asking me about uh, how circles work and um, about notifications in relation to uh, different communities that she's joining because we have different leaders and different schools starting communities um, all around the place. And so I thought I would just share a couple of um, quick uh, edgy wins that have been really great for me in relation to using circles in Google Plus. So I'll just go to my circles. Okay, so a couple of things that um, you may or may not be aware of when you're using circles is that um, the great thing about circles and uh, setting up your own customized circles is that you actually are in control um, then of what you see and um, what you're alerted to, I guess, on Google Plus. And that makes um, a big difference between Google Plus and some of the other social uh, networking sites is that you can actually customize who you share with um, and who shares with you. And so I have um, a number of different circles and um, you can set your circles up and call them whatever you want and I always say to people that um, that's a good idea to name circle something that um, you will remember but also you can put people in a circle like um, these are really annoying people that I actually don't want to associate with circle but just don't then go on a live hangout and um, share your circles to everyone. But a couple of really uh, cool things to do, so I have a GG Melbourne circle and when I click on my GG Melbourne circle, um, most people that are in our community and I haven't updated it recently, I've actually added to a circle because I'm really interested in learning about what the people in um, Melbourne are actually doing in uh, the Google space. Once I click on the circle, um, the thing that we've been doing quite a lot is actually encouraging people to share that circle. So I could now click on my share button in this circle and actually, well, that's gone really blurry, post this uh, out to everybody else or send it to a specific people or another circle and you guys could actually add everyone from the circle. So uh, if you're a teacher in a school and you are really trying to get the rest of your staff um, on board Google+, Plus, um, potentially sharing with them uh, you know, a circle that has every other staff member in it means that they don't have to um, create that circle themselves, that they can uh, get a kickstart with that. The other one that's really worthwhile doing in that respect is potentially um, starting a circle, and I haven't actually checked who's in it, but um, following, which might be a whole lot of the Google products and things that you want to follow, and there's a few random people in here, um, and encouraging people sharing that one out as well, and then people will actually see things in their home stream which are of uh, relevance and use to them, and it will encourage them to come back to Google+. Plus. Uh, one final thing to look at with this is um, I don't know how often you guys ever um, filter your home stream based on your circles, but you'll see when you're back on your Google Plus home stream that you actually have your circles listed across the top and you can just filter so that your stream here only has uh, information that's been shared by people in that particular circle. 
So when I click on IGHD Melbourne, please be nice to me, Telstra. Excellent. I'll now slowly see um, things in the stream that have been shared by people that I have in my GED Melbourne circle. There's a couple of other things you can do in relation to that. You can then also, which um, be very, very wary about doing, you can turn on notifications for this circle. So, for example, if there were a few people that um, you added to circles because they were sharing really fantastic things or people within your school that you actually wanted to make sure that you you kept up to date with everything that you shared, it would be a good idea to turn notifications on, put them in a little circle, turn the notifications on, and you'll actually get a notification every time they share. And you can also choose whether or not uh, these people's posts appear in your home stream and then if they are going to appear, how much to appear. Years. So as I mentioned before, um, if you have to, if you're obliged to have somebody in a circle that um, potentially shares things that drive you a little bit crazy, um, my recommendation would be put them in a circle and then either turn off their posts in your home stream or just make it fewer. Uh, and very, very finally, what I'll do is these are my circles across here, but a lot of people ask me, well, how do I, you know, I don't like that list of circles. These aren't my most common circles. So if you go back into your circles, so back into your people, and then back into your circles, you can actually rearrange your circles. And if I pick one up, so for example, um, I don't have very many friends, I only got 12 apparently. If I pick them up and drag them right to the front over here, this circle, when I go back to my home stream, you'll now see that I have my friends. Uh, up here and so I can actually filter um, my home stream by my friends. Um, so that's a couple of really quick um, tips about managing your circles um, and uh, I'm a big believer that Google Plus is a space that you get out what you put in and you want to encourage um, people to use this space because there's some amazing educators sharing some amazing things here um, and we're seeing some great communities emerge um, but you know, people will get out what they put in. So um, hopefully, people can uh, you know make it work for you by doing some of those little tricks. And Chris, uh, are we are we over to you now to do a little bit of a classroom demo? I believe so. Thank you very much for that, Kimberly. Okay. So um, you muted still, Chris? Am I back now? Yeah, awesome. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Kimberly. Um, some you fantastic, are, yes. Cool. Some fantastic tricks and tips around um, Google Plus and Circles in particular. So um, I'm going to share with you now um, Classroom. So um, there was a there is basically a preview version of Classroom, which you can apply for, and it's come out in drips and drabs. Um, from Google and they've authorized some people and they haven't authorized other people. And I don't think it's by any um, nature of hierarchy, it's a little bit of luck and chance. So um, people who have got Classroom at the moment, they're going to have an opportunity to give some feedback. And I know that people are getting Classroom invites every day. So if you have put your domain forward for um, a Classroom or access to Classroom, uh, hang in there because it will hopefully come along. Um, so what I'm going to do is just show you it. I'm not going to make any particular comments on it. I'm not going to give my opinion on it, which is um, strong, as with most of my opinions. Um, I, so I'm just going to show you, take you through the logistics of it, and then we're going to have a bit of a question and answer session, and some of those opinions and thoughts and areas for development will hopefully come out through that. So please remember to use the Q&A app, which is accessible on the stream if you're watching on the event on the top right-hand corner of the video. Um, you'll be able to see that. Um, so let's get on to screen sharing classroom. <laughs> okay, start screen share. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to bring this one back in. I'm going to try side to side double screen sharing. It's the most exciting thing I've ever done, I think. So in this incognito tab on the right hand side, I have um, my test students. So let's put um, them at home. This test student has only got one class allocated to them at the moment, so you'll see that in a second. So um, teacher view, we'll bring that in big first of all. Um, this is it. This is what my um, home screen of classroom looks like. I teach French and emerging technology, so I've currently got an emerging tech class with 26 students in it, and I've got my year 11 lovely little French class with 11 students. You can see they've actually got an assignment up and coming in a minute. Um, what I 
I'm going to do is to show you how to create a class, how to get students into a class, and how to uh, and what you can do once you're within a class. So to create a class, very simply, press plus at the moment, and I'm going to I'm going to call this test um, one, and the section is going to be let's say year eleven. Now I, I'm not sure if a section is a, an Austri um, an American term for grade or or year level, but I'm using it to say year eleven or which subject it is. So um, I'm going to create my class. And once I've created a class, I've got two ways to get students into it. I can add them uh, manually, or I can invite people. So if I will ignore stream for a second, we'll go back to students. The first thing I want to do is to get some kids into this class. Now you'll see up on the top right here is I've got a class code. So very importantly, at the moment, you can only create classes within your domain. So I can't I can't invite anybody who's outside of the John Monash Science School um, domain. I was I I had a play around with that because I was going to create um, uh, a class that you guys could all join, but unfortunately you have to be within the domain. Now there are great advantages to that, especially within primary, and one of our student, one of our questions in the Q&A app was around primary. Um, there we go. One of the, uh, um, and the protection of kids using the social stream um, within the domain. So the one thing I can do is I can give out the class code to my class, or I can add kids. So if I go into uh, all my contacts, and I look for that classroom um, test. Let's see if I can find that student. I've got that student. I click on their name. I can add a bunch of them. I can look for different names. I can add that student into this class pretty quickly. So uh, my emerging tech class is 25 kids. Took me a couple of minutes to get all the kids into that. That was fine. Um, and you can see here, I've got I've got that um, class list. I've also got an email icon. So if I want to email that student directly, I can actually do it without going into my Google Mail. Um, I can click on here and it'll generate an email which will go straight to them. What you'll see on the other side is a stream, and the stream is where you set, where you shine, um, sorry, where you share um, announcements and assignments at the moment. I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a second when we go to one of the um, other classes. This top area here with the purple bubbles on it, I can change that photo if I want to color code my um, classes differently. So I might want jelly beans and change the course image and you see it, it changes the, the um, band color here. So if I go back to my um, home screen, then I'm able to have different visuals for each of my classes which is quite helpful. So let's go into this one that I've created already for Geg Test. <clears throat> Nothing in here apart from an announcement I made this morning, which is welcome to the world. So if I, I did want to make an announcement, um, I can share with my class, as you can see, an attached file, a drive file, a YouTube video, or um, a link. So I can, I can share any of these things. So this isn't an assignment. This is a social space for me to share things with um, kids. Currently, in my own practice, I use Google Communities because I work in a senior secondary school, so I can use that with um, kids who are over 13. I, I use Google Communities to do very much this and share really um, fun things in French or videos or videos of cats or whatever you want to do. So um, check out this video. Um, I'm going to go to YouTube, and it gives you the insert video options of video search or URL, and I'm going to put um, irregular French verbs. So there's a nice um, video about a regular French verb. So I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to add it. Um, I might also want to um, actually put in a, a document to go with that as well, and I can add that through my Google Drive, and I can post that. So this is just an announcement. So this is just um, some information being given from me to the students, um, which is very, very different to an assignment. Now, um, what you'll see is from the student point of view, if I just go this way, if I go back into my gig test classroom here, you'll see that the student, classroom test student, uh, John Monash, has now got that announcement straight directly into their screen. Um, let's see, how long does it take to um, push an announcement? And I've got a feeling that that announcement will come up on this screen in a second but as a new item has been posted. So it doesn't push live to your screen, I don't think, at the moment. Um, so I need to click on that, and then you um, announce it will um, appear. So it's not quite like Google Plus, where often they'll, they'll appear as you go. Um, so, so yeah, so I can push out announcements, which is pretty easy. The, from what I can tell, the main function of Classroom at this point 
Again, I keep saying at this point because it is really, really in beta testing, and and as you'll see on the bottom here, there's actually a send feedback um, link, so um, people who are testing this can send lots of feedback, and I believe there is a lot of feedback being given so far. I'm going to set an assignment. So the assignment is slightly different. I need to give it a, t a title. One of the other things I teach is learn to. Um, we're doing a design thinking uh, project. Or thinking, whichever. Um, and description of the assignment, um, this is your workbook. I wonder why I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave that. I want to hand it in um, on Monday. I can actually obviously change that time, that day, up to anything. So if you are running a long project, you can actually leave quite a big open um, time frame for that. But let's say um, Monday. I can also add a time. So if I wanted to, I could. Um, I want it handed in at the end of the school day, which is 3:30 p.m. So I've set this um, at the minute. It doesn't feed into Google Calendar. It just sits in its own um, in glorious isolation in classroom. I'm sure that integration to Calendar will will come. Um, so what I can do then is I can attach a drive file. So I click on my um, drive. <clears throat> And what I want to look for here is um, L2. I'll make this big again so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, in L2 2014, I'm going to get a document. So I've got a workbook for kids working through this design thinking project. Um, sorry. So let me grab that and bring it back up the top here. Um, so I'll grab that and I'll, I'll add that in here. So you can see that that's here now. Um, I've also got a video that I want them to watch. Um, that playlist thing Penny did was fantastic, so um, I will be using that. I don't use it at the minute, so that's something I've learned tonight, which is great. Always good to learn new things. And I'm going to attach that video by clicking on YouTube and just pasting in the URL. So this is a video explaining the, the process that I want the kids to use. I'm going to add that as well. I could, again, add a link out to an external site if I wish to. Um, and this is the this is the important thing about the workbook um, is that I have an option here which is a little drop down. Students can view this file, which in that case, um, if they if I want them to make a copy because it's a workbook, they would have to manually do that. Um, students can edit the file, and that would give students the ability to edit that one file. So if you wanted kids to work collaboratively in a document in a class, then you could certainly let all of them edit the same file. Uh, as we probably know from experience, it's better working in smaller groups if you're going to work collaboratively on, on one document. Um, but that's certainly one thing you could do. But the thing I love, which um, is quite a powerful step forward, I think, is make a copy for each student. So what happens is that the test student gets a folder. I'm going to select that one. Gets a folder created in their drive automatically, which is classroom. And then within that folder, they'll get another folder for each of their classes. And then within that, they, they'll get their own copy of this document. So that, for me, is a, is a real win, because this document is um, very much one that I want. I'll just give you a quick look at it. This is one which has got information and things, but it's got um, questions and things to be filled in as well. So they'll get their own copy of that rather than having to have me uh, or having to manually create their own copies. So um, this is the class. If I wanted to um, send it off to multiple classes, I can drop down and actually say I'm going to send it out to my three English classes or my um, whatever it might be, my multiple classes. At the minute, I'm just going to send it out to Gate Test, and I'm going to assign that now. So I've got a title. I've said what it is. I've got a time to hand it in. Um, this is what goes out. This is a video to help you do it. I'm going to assign that now. So that assignment is currently winging its way across the Internet um, to my other um, friend over here. Let's just pull this one up. Okay, that assignment's now gone, and you'll see that I've got a new item posted to the stream. On the left-hand side of this class, I've got um, a due date, so June the 30th, and a link to the project. So the project's here. One of the weird things which, which threw me at first was that the document that I thought that I had assigned this project wasn't there. I thought I'd made a mistake. I thought I'd actually missed off um, assigning it. Um, but if I open this now, I can see I've got a title, um, when it was assigned, when it's due here. If I open it... I now have um, in a second when it comes. I now have my assignment um, in a page. You'll see back on the teacher page over here that um, this assignment, or the, the teacher view over here, is that this assignment is here. It's also telling me that um, zero people have turned it in. 
and one person has not turned it in. So this number would be 25 if nobody had turned it in. And I'll tell you about turning it in in just a second. So now, yeah, this is a bit better. So now I can see that I've got my um, document in here as well. So I'm OK, I can work in this document. Um, so this is now my own copy that I can work in. And then when I'm ready, I've done whatever work I need to do, I can then turn it in. Now what happens is, and this is what I understand the process, yeah, we haven't tested it with lots of kids, but what I believe happens is that when I turn in that workbook as a student, I will no longer have editing rights over it. Um, so once that's turned in, I will not be able to edit that anymore. So I'm going to turn that in. Here you go, teacher. Thanks. And then, so it says you'll lose the ability to edit files. So that gets turned in. And then back ho hopefully over here. That's gone in now, turned in. Uh, I will, yep, yeah, we've changed now to turned in. So if I click on that, uh, I can see, yep, yeah, brilliant. This, guy, this guy's turned it in. Okay. And what I can do is I can then go into their document, I can have a look at it, I can, um, you know, well, this is the interesting thing, and maybe we'll leave this to Q&A, but at this moment, we're going to imagine that I'm that the student's turning in this piece of work, and I'm just going to grade it. So I can, um, there's a point scale of 1, 20, 50, or 100, or ungraded with no point value, and I can give a grade in here. So I'm going to say that is 100 out of 100. Um, well done. Um, and then... I want that one there. Um, this is the bit where I've got stuck now. I've lost the bit where I can press uh, return it. So click that one. I've done that. I want to return it. Status turned in. Sorry, people. Hmm. I thought I had a little button there which was return. Maybe I've missed something there. There is an option to return that to the student. Um, what you'll see back on the kids' side is they can actually unsubmit their work as well. So if they accidentally submit their work, then they can unsubmit it and, and get back editing rights. Um, now, I think this opens up a huge number of questions around what the purpose of Classroom is and, and, uh, and what it does and, and how we can best use it and the kind of feedback that we need to give. Um, but it's certainly a step forward in developing a learning management system, I suppose, on Google's um, behalf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump across to back in the Hangout. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm happy to go back and share that screen in a moment. Um, let me just get the Q&A out, Bob. But um, yeah, so we're open up for any questions, really, and any thoughts. I know it's a very, very whirlwind um, tour and probably very badly done, but um, any questions or any thoughts around um, Classroom? Brilliant. Thanks, Scott. Um. Chris, while, um, while people are potentially putting in some more questions, um, while you were going, then um, we had a bit of a chat with the people that are in our hangout here around some questions um, that maybe we can start with because they might be on other people's minds. Um, and um, and there was, I think there's a couple of questions in the Q&A as well. Um, but uh, one of the questions was around um, assigning other teachers to a class. And um, my understanding is, and um, tell me if you've discovered any different at this point, Chris, that you can only have the one teacher in the class at the time, and you can have other teachers in the class, but only as a student. Yeah, that's that's absolutely the case at the moment. But um, in a school who does um, team teaching, like we do at John Monash, so two kids, uh, two kids, two kids and fifty teachers, that'd be interesting. Two <laughs> teachers and and fifty kids. Um, that would be an essential feature that we would need. Can I just thank Scott Duncan in the um, in the um, Q and A? I'll just show you for a second. The um, the button that I couldn't find is um, hopefully you've got my screen back. The button I couldn't find is the massive big blue button that says return. <laughs> so, so, so this huge button here telling you to return back um, is indeed the one I couldn't find. But thanks for that, Scott. Um, we are all learners as ever. Let me just unscreen share. Yeah, so at the moment you can't you can't include another teacher, but I know that's um, strong feedback that's come back from lots of people. Uh, can I just say on that turn in thing, Chris? Then that um, the reason I think that's there is because you could when you have multiple assignments, if you have twenty five assignments handed in from your twenty five different mm -hmm. kids, you can tick them all and return them all at once rather than having to go through the process and individually return them all. One of the things that I think. Um, 
is really interesting um, around that uh, returning the work back to the students is the um, the transfer of ownership that happens between the student and the teacher when the work gets turned in and and then back again as well. Um, and I think that's really, that sort of streamlines some of those processes in terms of the kids once they've turned it in, not being able to edit it anymore, but then you can give it back to them and um, then they have the chance to, you know, reflect on on the feedback that you've given them and potentially improve their work from that point so that their final turned in work doesn't have to be their final, final copy. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because as it stands by its design, I think it's a summative, I think it's a management tool for starters, but I think the assessment part of it, the assessment piece in it is in, in fact a summative assessment piece and you've just hacked it by saying you can give it back and give them feedback based on that. Um, but the, there is a limit on, you'd have to do that by giving no grade assigned and then the feedback and kind of taking it back and forward which is which is interesting. I would be really interested to see if there's a system which allows for formative, ongoing formative feedback throughout the process and also a final handing in summative um, system, which is slightly different, so that the emphasis is is away from grading in the formative and towards um, much more feedback and feed forward. Mm. Um, one of the other questions we had um, was from Barbara in the Q&A, and um, I've had a few teachers who I work with ask me this question as well in relation to um, the primary school versus secondary school setup for classroom. Um, and um, both Chris and I um, are secondary teachers, um, so obviously, you know, we've both come at exploring classroom from that secondary point of view. But um, in terms of the the primary teachers, um, I don't think that you necessarily have to think of. And Chris, you can feel free to contradict me. I wouldn't necessarily think for primary teachers that you have to think of just having the one classroom for your kids and for your class. So you could have a classroom for you know, um, different units or different, you know, literacy and numeracy and things like that as well. Um, so it's not necessarily about just having to have one space that everything's in. If you ran, you know, depending on how you structure what your curriculum design's like at your school, you might actually find that um, it is uh, of some value to potentially have different classrooms for different things that you are working on um, as, a, as a, a grade. Chris, did you want to say anything on that? No, I think that's that's a really valid point. Um, in terms of, because I think some of the best practice uh, I ever see is in the primary classroom and how, how do you manage project-based learning? Well, go and have a look in a primary classroom and see all these kids working at, at different speeds on different things. Um, I think uh, in terms of the actual the construct, it's, it is very, it's very American-centric. So, you know, even the wording of assignment and grading um, um, and kind of having these summative things, I think it's a it's it's a model which often um, is is prevalent in the in the states, and that's where it's come from. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think that's very applicable. The one thing, or the as I mentioned before, I think um, the Google Plus communities is this whole thing around um, you know kids have to be over thirteen in order to really use it because it's got a social um, aspect to it. Um, this this gives you the advantage of. Um, kids being able to put things in the stream, conversations developing within the stream, but keeping it a very close private community. So in terms of using that in a primary school, I think that's a real advantage of it, in fact. Um, there's we another question in the Q&A um, from Nigel. I don't know if you've seen that one, Chris. Yeah. And can you give text feedback at the assignment level or will it need to be as a document? So you can give text feedback. Let me just get into the right screen and, and share that again with you. Um, it's an interesting one because I would still, I'm very a, a big fan of giving kind, specific, and helpful um, feedback. Uh, and the thing with being specific is I want to show the kids the, the, the small parts of their work that when um, improved would indeed make the whole better. Um, and there is, a, there is a capacity to give back feedback. Um, there we go. Yeah, so I can actually give back some feedback here. Um, this is a great piece of work, yeah. And I can give quite detailed feedback there, but it's not within the context of the work. And one of the things I absolutely love about um, uh, Google Docs is, in fact, within Google Docs, I mean, this is a blank document, so there's no work in there, but that's okay. I can do a couple of things. I can actually give kind, specific, and helpful feedback um, via uh, comments. So I can highlight a piece of the document. I can give my feedback here and feed forward what you could do to improve. And this for me is the, the you know the formative 
the formative um, piece. So giving those things within the comment because it's specific to that area, I know how to improve it. Um, and just something that did come up in the Q&A as well, you'll notice that this new drop down is up here for editing in docs. Uh, after the Google I.O. conference this morning, there are lots of um, um, new things happening in docs, including things like mobile editing of slides, which is wonderful. But I can actually um, now in docs just make suggestions. So I could say, for example, instead of presentation, it might be um, whiz, bang, amazing presentation. Oh, no. And now instead of um, instead of me actually editing over the top, it's it's gone into that track changes mode, and the person will then have to say I own this document, so it's me. But will then have to accept or reject that suggestion. So that's quite that's a really nice. I think that's a really much more powerful, focused way to give feedback and feed forward. This stuff here, in terms of um, giving big picture feedback on the project is is or on the piece of work is great. But I think that giving that granular level feedback is really important as well. If that answers Nigel's question. Oh, yeah, I think that was, I think you did a good job of that. Um, there was also um, a comment, uh, more so than a question, I think, from um, Scott in the Q and A, in relation to the um, rubric format, assigning different grades and things like that. And I think uh, one of the things for everyone to keep in mind, as Chris has already mentioned, that you know this is the first iteration of Classroom, and like all Google products, um, I would expect to see some really really big changes and upgrades um, over the next little while as they as they do source from everybody who is um, going to use that as much feedback as possible um, and you know you know we all use rubrics a lot but um, potentially you know they have it in the, it's not in the first thing uh, first iteration but I would expect to see some of those things change um, over time and and for that mark book component of classroom to actually be one of the things that uh, we see some really big, drastic changes in, in terms of being able to to do stuff with that data. So you know, extract it more easily and and track it over time. And it ha it's got the integration with Drive to be able to create folders in uh, a kid's drive and to be able to create documents in a kid's drive. So I'm sure it's got the it's got the potential to uh, hello. It's got the potential to um, to do the same thing with. Uh, Mark, for example, to, to, to pull all that together and create a spreadsheet in your Drive folder. Just um, very quickly, um, I did forget to show this bit here. If I um, Drive um, is actually, I forgot to say that, it, I think I did say it in fact, but it does um, create a folder in Drive for the kids, which is, which is nice, so it helps them to stay organized. Um, so if I just very quickly screen share back again. Um, there you go. Hopefully you can see that. Then um, if I go to my this one here, is you'll see that um, this is the kids version, so classroom test student. They now have a classroom folder which is created for them. And then within that folder they've got um, the two classes that I've assigned to them. Then within that folder they've now got the um, the the original copy and also my, and now their own copy of the Design Thinking Workbook, so they can now work through that. So they've got a shared copy, which they can view, but they've also got their own copy as well. Um, so so that's I really like that organizational aspect of, of, of Classroom in terms of creating that. Let me just get back off here. Um, just one other thing I think is probably worth, um, I, I think there's something come up in the chat again um, around this and someone um, from within our Hangout was talking about parent access to Classroom um, and you know once again uh, in, if, you have, if you had parents uh, within your domain, within your education domain then um, you know they would obviously have, they could be a student in your class but at this point um, there, as Chris mentioned at the, at the start, you actually cannot um, invite anyone outside of your domain um, into one of your classes. So um, that, that limits the, the parent involvement in that social stream and that workflow process. Yeah. Um, and Caitlin mentioned um, in the Q&A as well um, about how similar it looks to um, 
Edmodo, and um, I've had quite a few teachers say that to me as well. Um, and I think one of the one of the really great advantages of this, as as Chris alluded to as well, is that um, you know Google Plus and the communities in there have been really really great for secondary teachers, um, but there hasn't really been an equivalent for primary teachers because uh, under 13s obviously cannot use Google Plus. Um, and so I think this is a really big step forward um, for primary teachers. Um, having a space, a safe space to work with their kids in. Uh, there's, um, I don't know if there's anyone else out there who can answer this one. There are a couple of people who mentioned um, the difference between her power dashboard, um, teacher dashboard, that's what it's called, isn't it? Um, and the uh, and classroom. I think that you know the currently the it's it, classroom next to her power dashboard is, is limited, um, but it'll be interesting to watch that space into. And to see what happens with that, um, but certainly if you want a, if you want a free option, which is about ki getting kids organised and, and helping them to um, di or helping yourself to distribute work and to collect it in, then I would probably start off with Google Classroom. Um, but it doesn't do the great things that Hapara does, like giving you the ability to push out URLs and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'd say I'd agree with you, Chris. There's a lot of things that Hapara Teacher Dashboard um, do that Classroom doesn't. Um, you know, I know, I know a lot of teachers are loving the fact that they can see um, have visibility, like full visibility, into their students' um, drive folders through Teacher Dashboard. Um, whereas with Classroom, we are talking on a um, you know more individual document or assignment uh, level. We're actually seeing that, but also things like being able to see um, blog posts that uh, kids have written through um, Teacher Dashboard in all in the one screen, um, and then the remote desktop function that um, a lot of schools like as well. Those things aren't integrated into um, Classroom, and um, you know who knows what the future will look like with that. But there's definitely um, still a space at the moment for Classroom and um, and Teacher Dashboard, and Eleni's just put in our chat that, yeah, in Teacher Dashboard you can also see the kids' um, emails, which um, Classroom doesn't give you any access to that sort of thing. Yeah. You can email directly from Classroom using the, that built-in um, email um, function. I think when we had some discussions up at Edutech um, about Classroom when it was first kind of launched, there was definitely talk about it not being there to replace any third-party products, but actually to provide support and, and native functionality within Google Apps for Education so that people who use Google Apps for Education could just do it a little bit better, I suppose. Whatever the future brings, obviously, is, as uh, Kenby says, um, yeah, totally different. And Rich Lambert in the chat, hi, Rich, has just um, talked about how, it, in his in his eyes, that it's more likely that it's, it's a very different product to, touch, to teach a dashboard, and you can see it replacing Edmodo more than Hapara. Guys, it's getting on to eight past eight. If, has anybody got any last things that they want to um, um, say or add? Hopefully everyone can come along to GG Melbourne. My voice is disappearing as the night goes on. But yeah, make sure you check out the event and come along. Nice, nice plug there, Eleni. Well done. Okay, guys. So we're going to um, stop the broadcast. Please get onto the Google Educator Group um, communities and get on Google Plus and continue these conversations. Uh, connect with the people who you've um, listened to tonight and and, and mine them for ideas because they're full of great ones. And don't forget to share your ideas um, back with us too. So thank you very much. Hang out, if you want to hang on for a couple of minutes. I'm going to stop the broadcast and we'll have a quick chat. Thank you.